Hello and welcome back to Podcasting as Praxis. I'm David, my pronouns are he and him. I'm James, my pronouns are they and them. I'm Jamie, my pronouns are he and him. I'm Rob, my name he and him. I'm Alistair, my pronouns are also he and him. A full house, again, for the first time in like, I don't know, like what, A while. two weeks? And then yeah, something like six that. weeks before that or some shit, like fuck it. I don't know, we don't do this properly anymore. Um, schedules are bad and work is shit and... No one likes anything. That's the positive note. I'm starting this episode on anyway. It's a great time to be online. Yeah. So yeah. Um, but luckily, we are joined this week by a wonderful guest, returning podcasting champion, Juliet Jakes. Hi, I'm Juliet. My pronouns are she and her. Welcome back. Thanks. Why would you do this to yourself? I don't know. I mean, I, I came back on Twitter for some reason. It just immediately drove me nuts. And um, so just in a guys, self-destructive spiral. Yeah, I mean, you guys were tweeting and I was just like, can I come on your podcast and start shouting? And you said yes. So um, yeah. Juliet sat, Here sat we on are. Twitter. Juliet sat on Twitter and said, this screaming void is not enough for me. No, I, I need a, a voidier <laughs> void in which to scream. Um, I did actually... Yeah. Because, you know, I, I like culture. That's, that's my thing. Um, so I have actually brought uh, a piece of poetry that's um, related to a topical story. I wonder if I could, could read it to you. You certainly may. Please. This is uh, Funeral by Hugh Lemmy. Um, and it's relevant to some uh, goings on in the British government recently. So, uh, so I'll read it to you. It's a real favourite of mine. Pour out the bolly, cut up the coke. Prevent the journo from tweeting your dirty joke. Silence the press and with muffled drum. Bring out the porker. Let David Cameron come. <laughs> Lord Ashcroft circles, his rumour a corker. Spinning on sky the message, he fucked a porker. Call up the shriek, priest or faith healer. And imagine Dave Cameron balls deep in a squealer. <laughs> He was my north, my south, my least, my most, my porking week and my Sunday roast, my noon, my midnight, my small, my big. I never thought he'd fuck a pig. <laughs> the star is not wanted now. Shut up, everyone. Shut down the mail and dismantle the sun. Pour away the ocean and dry up the bog. And remember, the PM face fucked a hob. <laughs> it's the it's the version of four weddings at a funeral we should have had quite frankly exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh that, that was that was very good thank you for bringing that to my attention one uh, yes. one good thing about having Perfect. him back i think is getting to revisit all of that you know the best day in the history yeah. of the internet um yeah yeah, it's not, it's not. It's like any time they mention Thatcher, you get that little like, micro high of remembering oh, she's dead. This is the next best thing. <laughs> I think the um, the actual best day on the internet was Ricey and Gibble. In my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're going to go into my sort of days in like melt and melt adjacent journalism in a bit. But um, when Thatcher died, I was writing a column for the New Statesman. Um, and I probably shouldn't make this public, but, you know, fuck them. Um, <laughs> but I got an email. I might even have spoken about this before. But I got an email from um, from somebody at the Statesman who is not much liked online, just saying, "Look, Margaret Thatcher has just died. Tensions are running high, and New Statesman blogger says X about Thatcher makes a very easy story. So please be very careful on social media." So I basically just didn't really get to uh, enjoy it, except you know, sort of sniggering silently uh, from the sidelines. So. Um, you know, there was no such constraint for me with Pig Day, so um, <laughs> did enjoy that a lot more. <laughs> I was working in pubs at the time when the pig thing happened, and I spent an entire shift gleefully telling everyone that I served <laughs> all about it. Telling people <laughs> it was every so opportunity. Good. Everyone, everyone remembers what they were doing when they found out that David Cameron <laughs> fucked a dead pig. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember. Um, my my flatmate was a lot less online than me, and so in the morning I like knocked on her door and I was like, "Helen, have you have you been on the internet this morning?" She was like, "No, why?" And I you said, see the "Go on Twitter." Newswire. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> and I said, uh, "Go on Twitter and um, type in the word piggate," and she just said, "Piggate," and I said, "Yeah, piggate," and she was like, "Are you sure?" And I just said, "Yeah, trust me." 
went back to what I was doing and like a minute later just heard this like eruption of laughter uh, went back into her bedroom and she just went I wasn't expecting that <laughs> I, I was fortunate enough to have my um, English uncle staying over uh, rest in peace and on the morning it happened um, I wandered through and he's in his dressing gown at the dining room table and I said uh, Uncle Kevin um, you won't believe it but David Cameron fucked a dead pig and he just looked at me and he lit up like crisps. He said, he didn't. I just got that kind of look on his face. And then when I said, no, he did, uh, you know, and showed my phone, he just laughed for five minutes solid. Like the guy just did. He was really clutching his sides by the end of it. So, uh, yeah, he's from he was from Hull. So, you know, you can see why there'd be a lot of, uh, you know, delight in that particular story. It was great. It was awesome. Happiest I've ever seen him. I just remember being in the Brixton Academy smoking area with one of my mates, yelling at the top of our lungs at all and sundry that David Cameron fucked a dead pig. And it's all been downhill ever since, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nothing's ever going to be that good again. Um, no. This is what they took from us. But they brought it back. <laughs> yeah. They brought, but like it's like an encore performance. It's never really as good, you know. Like you're just, it's just, you know, it's just, it's just the yeah. sloppy seconds. Bring of, back of... Crystal Pig Fucker. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, yeah. I just can't, can't believe. Well, I mean, I can believe that they brought it back. It's some kind of. I think it's some kind of insane gambit that like. Apparently, something like ten percent of Lib Dems still would vote for the Tories if David Cameron was in charge. So it's like a weird <laughs> gambit to like shore up the home countries. Only I guess. ten? Yeah. yeah. I say, yeah. No, imagine, it's... imagine getting the votes of ten people. <laughs> <laughs> well, we might. Well, I mean, the Tories might not need to be that concerned uh, anyway, because like we started talking about Thatcher, um, and and you know, much like David Cameron is making sort of a wearing thin comeback. Um, I think at this moment, uh, Rishi Sunak must be keeping uh, all his fingers crossed uh, because the insane new fash that the uh, Argentinians just elected, uh, Mile, um, has said that, you know, that the uh, Malvinas are uh, Argentinian and, you know, that he, he would make every effort to, to get them back. So, like, I can only encourage this and, you know, we, we can have a yomp to yomp harder situation, basically. How, how every effort is he talking here, like? Well, sadly, also, so also, far, like... how seriously do we have to take the word of, like, free market Fred West? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. not at all, but, like, how seriously did we have to take the word of, like, some insane Argentinian general with, like, you know, five kilos of platinum on his epaulette before it happened? <laughs> <laughs> I do love the look of the guy. It's fucking great. He looks yeah. like an e-fit of every single guy who ever coached football in the 70s. <laughs> well, I, suppose, I suppose it actually helps that we've got uh, Juliet on tonight because she'd probably be able to tell us which 90s, 70s side, the lower league side he played for in, uh, in Britain. <laughs> she uh, she Sheffield United in 1978-79. Um, <laughs> sort of plodding midfield enforcer. Like, you know, he couldn't really run or pass, but he could just like boot people up in the air. Yeah, yeah smoke, like, like, smoke like 90 a day. <laughs> numerous red cards for bringing a chainsaw onto the pitch, things like that. Well, he said, well back then, that was like a talking to. That wouldn't have been a, wouldn't have been a booking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the game's gone, really, isn't it? Really has, yeah. <laughs> he, really, he really does look like his family albums by Panini, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 according to like a brief LBC piece I read about him, he also apparently uh, likes to dress up as his super as his superhero alter ego, General and Cap. So you know, <laughs> is that short for Andy Cap? <laughs> <laughs> You made that up. That's no, not real. No, 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 he's I, I, not I, I, called General Ancap. No, it's he. He likes to dress up as General Ancap. I'm not saying he, you know, maybe maybe in a playful mood or something. But yeah, I've um <laughs> I've got some pictures of uh, General Ancap here. Um, someone on Reddit oh, calls please. him Base Ancap President. Um, <laughs> that's his fucking all. Oh, no, maybe even his like main account on Reddit. It's got to be this guy is a Reddit guy. If there ever was one. His oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yep, there he is. <laughs> oh my it's god. great when you see that for the first time and you realize this is a world leader. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah it is. <laughs> well, he looks if like we a, that he would looks be like the, a uh... 
It looks because like a two is, episode um, villain from the Chuckle Brothers. <laughs> 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 because we're uh, we're on an audio medium. I mean, I'm the guest, but I'm going to take the liberty of trying to describe oh, this. Please. So yeah, good basically, luck. what you've got <laughs> is um is a sort of late sixties, early seventies, like Northwest England comedian. Um, <laughs> Wearing a pair of like yellow washing up gloves and pointing at the uh, the lens, um, a yeah. sort of black and yellow sort of American football top by the looks of it, with big shoulder pads and some sort of like yellow cape. Um, yeah. He's got a sort of cheaper version of those sorts of like um, kind of eye mask type things that you'd wear mask. to a mask ball. It looks like um, he's wearing upside down. I upside want to down, yes. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. it is upside down. Um, it, and and he's, he's sort of holding some sort of scepter. Um, it, it genuinely looks like a prop from Stargate. I don't know what the fuck that's about. <laughs> <Do you know laughs> <what? Yeah. laughs> I was going to say, it, it looks like he uh, he stole the, the staff of Rita, the evil space witch from Power Rangers. He <laughs> looks like Banana Man's <laughs> Wario. <laughs> 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 and uh behind behind him you can see the facebook twitter and instagram uh logos so presumably if you want to Perfect. you know share yeah. captain and cap to social media of your choice you can do yeah that. if we uh if if, if, if we remember this we'll we'll make this the episode art so you can and you can make you can enjoy <laughs> this along with us sorry general and cap captain and cap is stupid yeah, he's, he got promoted for... <laughs> it was a battlefield promotion. <laughs> I want him to go on a diplomatic mission to Greece. <laughs> Greece the country or Greece the musical? It looks like it Both. could kind of be either. <laughs> oh, Greece the country. I want to see how well the non-aggression pact's holding up these days. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, sadly, so far, uh, Captain, sorry, G- <laughs> apologies, sir, uh, General Ancap. Um, <laughs> yeah, how dare you mistitle this hero of uh, <laughs> capitalist thought? I mean, sadly, so far, he's saying that he, he thinks it should be done with, like, diplomacy and, like, a referendum by the inhabitants of the uh, Malvinas, but, like, those are all, like, the most insane British people from, like, decades of inbreeding. So, like, I don't think that he's going to yeah, get Yeah, didn't thrown. we have a referendum that returned, like, oh, actually 105% of us want to remain British? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah but, but yeah, basically, and- like, a, a more isolated version of Gibraltar, which is an interesting social experiment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, Sunak has already come out strongly and said he refuses to negotiate. So, you know, diplomatic options are out the window. So I can only, you know, I can only hope that, that the next, uh, that, that we're going to get the next best option of like the world's most t- too tired and like has been c- countries like just sort of, I don't know, rolling around on the same sheep field island again for, for literally no good reason whatsoever. I get I get mm. the feeling that like, so Sunak, Sunak just telling this guy to piss off, but then... Uh... Keir Starmer would just been like, oh no, we definitely need to go to war for this thing. For this oh yeah. Uh, again. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, I'm a hard-nosed political operator and the only way to actually achieve my political aims, uh, this section left blank, is to go to war over a fucking island. Yeah. Wear suits, show the flag and, uh, you know, make use of veterans I think was the, was the line. So, you know, what better way mm. than to create more veterans of the world's stupidest conflict? Honestly, let this guy kick her ass. I think it would be a fitting end to, like, you know, a British national myth. Just, like, this guy, and just, like, that, see this that, guy stenciled everywhere. That guy this looks guy like if you, you tried to invade a country, you would somehow lose Brazil in the process. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we should do to prove our, our relevance as a fucking, like, empire once again is just build a mech in the, in the like, and just stand it off the coast of, like, of, uh, of Argentina. Just occasionally have it hurl giant poppies at their skyline. <laughs> <laughs> it's a re- it's going to be a really fucking like l- low watermark going from the Suez crisis to the fucking Malvinas crisis in two thousand and twenty. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I do like, like the idea of building like a new Colossus of Rhodes, but like installing like a big catapult on top or the Brexit railgun. What if we equip the Colossus of Rhodes with the Brexit railgun? <laughs> yeah, what if we just built a giant wicker man? <laughs> had it like march across the ocean to do battle <laughs> they've almost Thatcher, certainly yeah. got at least one wicker man in the Falklands <laughs> yeah did <laughs> you picture the, the, the giant mech towering over the one in the Falklands and like never talk to me or my island son again 
Yeah, while America was working on Dr. Manhattan, uh, this is what Britain was working on. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but he's not even a real doctor it. either. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Malvinus is a licensed chiropractor, actually. <laughs> <laughs> But we are we are closer to like having having a big um, g- uh, Brit- Britain Gundam than ever before uh, because we we're quite close to like probably maybe question mark the like the final budget of this era of the the Tory government uh, so th- they they've really put some some big think uh, into this one uh, this is from two different pieces in True. the Financial Times uh, they have come up with a new thing. An artificial intelligence hit squad unit is going to be set up right. at the heart Stop of Stop there. Stop yep. there. Stop there. That's a good policy. Right there. A hit squad to kill artificial intelligences is a good policy. Say no more and I'll be content. Again, that would require them to actually invent artificial intelligence. <laughs> Sure. I, 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 you're wrong, uh, Alastair, because like now we have Grok, which is the edgy AI. So you know, clearly, <laughs> fuck we're, off. We're there. Oh, for fuck's sake. Um, but yeah, the uh, the uh, AI. I, I'm hit fu- squ- I fully support. I fully support a government hit squad if the first thing they do is <laughs> the rifle. <laughs> <laughs> Edit note, please don't engage with that comment. <laughs> um, so yeah, their, their remit, of course, will, will, will not be to uh, with a rifle, uh, but most <laughs> sadly... <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Rob. <laughs> you just put a big uh, button in front of Rob that just said, do not touch. I know, said, do I, not touch I know. <laughs> um, now, of course, their remit will be to shrink the size of the UK civil service and bu- boost the public service productivity. Um, so, you know, it, but don't worry about it. it, it it's in good hands. Uh, they want to recruit, recruit 30 high-end, technically capable AI and data engineers and give them a budget of 5 million. So I'm sure 5 million will, will, <laughs> will sort it out. I mean, how much that's, money is, uh, is like open AI burning through at like per hour at this point? Like it's it's insane, right? I, I, don't, I don't know, but it's like... Five million is like four gamer chairs and a graphics card. They wouldn't even <laughs> all be able to sit down. I mean, it's spending five million quid to burn down like tens of hundreds or thousands of square miles of the Amazon rainforest so that we can automate the DWP telling you that your appeal for your I mean... egregious fucking... Uh, sanctions. Let's just, just say at this no, point, you know? you're only you're just adding extra steps in. At this point, the system's great at telling you to fuck off as it is. Yeah, but they get to fire some people. I mean, if they're gonna if they're gonna <laughs> spend five million on this, it's just gonna be them giving like a hundred and sixty grand each to thirty nerds. That's basically what's gonna happen here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the sad thing is, is like this is you know it, uh, like a fraction of what Mister Beast makes in a year. So like you couldn't even get Mister Beast <laughs> to, to do this. For you. <laughs> Can I prom- please ask Mr. you to Beast never to the head of the civil service? <laughs> never. So ever we're talking about the mob by how much? Right? <laughs> <laughs> please never ever relate government spending to the earnings of Mr. Beast in my presence again. I don't want to think about that. It's fucking terrifying. Too late. It's all it's all measured in uh, Mr. Beasts now. Yeah. <laughs> Mr's Beast, surely. Yeah. <laughs> Messer's Beast. <laughs> Please, Messer Beast was my father. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, now, apparently, uh, you know, it, it, this is this is actually really Messer's good news. Beast is uh, David Cameron <laughs> superhero alter ego. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, now, apparently, uh, that like th- this unit's actually going to be like good throughout because, like, um, stop uh, calling it a fucking unit. Like, <laughs> no, I, mean? I will it's not. Some dorks in an office somewhere. It's not special forces. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's because uh, you know because they're going to be using AI means you can. And this will be quoting from the article, and which is quoting uh, g- g- uh, Oliver Dowden, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. By the way, um, you can both <laughs> enhance outputs, so get better services for people, and with lower inputs, so lower cost. So you know, there's nothing but upsides to 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 getting more uh-huh. AI in. And would you be surprised that the, first, that the unit's first priority will be to tackle welfare fraud? 
And I know we've said this before wow. in a previous podcast, but the Dutch did this, and then a lot of people died. You know. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's not going to stop them. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. The second priority was, of course, the assisting the processing of asylum claims, and then overhauling the interface between the public and the NHS. So you know, yeah, three again, of your rather fears. than doing nothing, rather than just doing nothing, which they have been doing, uh, they've also they've d- spent five million pounds on an out of office email reply that just says no. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. The big <laughs> the big problem with the NHS, everyone's always saying it's the interface. You know, yeah. No one likes having to queue up to go through the RS two three two port to get like a fucking doctor's appointment or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look. Of course, this whole fucking thing is a joke. But the thing that they're trying to do, which is of course backed by Labour as well, because they keep talking about you know getting more AI specifically in the in the NHS, is um. And this was they they were doing they were holding like an event at the same time as that idiot AI summit where like Elon Musk was on stage like sucking off uh, Rishi Sunak or the other way around I can't, can't really remember. Um, Again, this from the Financial Times. Uh, 100 Whitehall civil servants gathered at the London headquarters of consultants PricewaterhouseCooper. Aided by teams of AI technologists Oof. from Microsoft, officials were invited to a hackathon to explain ways that the AI yeah, could Yeah, where they hacked pr- down the Amazon rainforest. That's why it's called that. <laughs> <laughs> To explain the the ways that AI could boost productivity in the UK's cash-strapped public sector, so you know the point of this is not to have you know the the the, the A team, but for you know engineering weebs, but for but for this for you know ever more grifting claws to get their hands into the public purse, but this way this time not by PFI or something else, this way this time by way of um, you know artificial intelligence. I love when the government describes its employees as cash strapped. Yeah, I mean they can't yeah. do anything about it, David. You know, like the government just no, has no that's money. Beyond the yeah. Yeah, 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 it's just the it's the it's that thing from Monopoly where it's just the Monopoly man with the empty like turn that's pockets and they're empty. Oh, that's unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, won't won't try I mean, again. The, the the article is actually quite good and did go on to point out that like large parts of the NHS are basically still like using Windows ninety eight computers so like it it will just die on its ass even if you like tried it to write like an AI prompt or something. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love the, I love the thought of like hospitals trying to run like fucking Chat GPT locally or some shit and just immediately burning out every CPU and GPU they've got like in the building. I mean, if they're back on like Windows ninety five, they probably don't even have GPUs. No, it's gonna be Voodoo it's gonna be funny when yeah, it's gonna be funny when like the um, you know what I mean? AI destroys everything, and the NHS is still standing because the computers were too shit to run it. It'd be like a, like a pound shop <laughs> Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> 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 Only two things will survive: the NHS and the nuclear deterrent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Nile and Eliza. <laughs> oh fuck's sake! I like the idea that instead of you know nine Cylons, including a beautiful woman, like the the AI will be like these these thirty spotty AI geeks who are just like sitting in an office replicating themselves because they're bored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the other the difference though is that you immediately know that they're a Cylon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, though, in like slightly uh, less good news, uh, there was a ruling from the UK Supreme Court. I still can't get used to the fact that that has a Supreme Court these days. Um, Not for much longer, though. <laughs> um, well, they are traitors to the people. I mean, they, they are, especially giving to, to today's ruling. Um, that apparently delivery riders can't be recognized as employees or be represented by trade unions for collective bargaining. It's, um, it's that's so stupid based- for, reason, for reasons, the dumbest fucking thing in the world. Because in theory, delivery drivers can subcontract their work to other people and they can choose whether or not to take particular orders. That means that they're not employees. Yeah. <laughs> well, they should all just fucking strike. Yeah, I mean, they should. Yes, they have, will just and... run them all over, though. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need Might to, be we more... need to keep them all... we... No, we need to give Keir Starmer the reins of power to keep him out of the 4 by 4 Got to keep him busy to keep the delivery drivers safe. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, the the judgment says that, like, as as James was saying, that like because um, like yeah, like delivery riders can like get someone else to cover their shift or like um, get someone else to do it for them. Um, Anyone that- can do that. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's kind that's of any job ever. That just sounds like <laughs> sounds like nobody should be allowed a union. Then. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll read you just a little bit from the the judgment. Riders are thus free to reject offers of work, make themselves unavailable, and to undertake work for competitors. It said once again, these features are fundamentally inconsistent with any notion of an employment relationship. So you know, just the fact that you can't, you know, I would ask the UK Supreme Court first what coercion under capitalism is, because yes, you you can say no, but you know, how are you going to pay rent and eat and that all that kind of jazz? Right, I'm right. not going to make the mistake I was about to. I was going to say that's mad because it's not like there's some sort of non-compete clause in your contract when you go to work with McDonald's to say you can't also work for Burger King. But I know fine well if I do that, someone is going to tell me actually there is, and I don't want to know. That's cursed oh, information. Oh, well, there, there was, fact, but those so have I'm mainly been outlawed in the US. Uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk about their replacement thing yeah, in, in but a moment. You'd be oh, caught wow. out there, Dave, because of McDonald's anti-monarchist uh, clause. That's why. <laughs> ah. I mean, this, of course... Uh, what this the judgment- wide and varied ideological um, positions that McDonald's can hold simultaneously? It's pro-Palestine, yeah. it's anti-Palestine, it's pro-monarchy, it's anti-monarchy. Madness. I mean, all, all of this is, of course, after Deliveroo signed that, you know, scab-ass, weird, like, voluntary union agreement with Scab Union GMB, uh, which yeah. the contract does say that, like, the riders are, are still independent contractors and not entitled to sick or holiday pay. GMB is such a fucking scab union. Jesus fucking Christ. It's incredible. Um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, you can bet that, like, now that this ruling has come down, that, like, every other gig company, you know, um, is going to try to follow suit on this one. Even though Uber, like... Oh, 100%. Uber, uh, yeah, but the High Court... Oh, sorry, sorry the Supreme Court um, did say that, like, Uber drivers are employees, and I suspect because, like... They have to submit their, like, driver's license or something, so they, they you know, they can't say, well, you can swap uh, the, the driver out with somebody else because it's, like, licensed to a car and the driver, I guess, or something. I don't know. But, yeah, like, 100%. I'm presuming that's because if, if it turns out that Uber drivers are, like, not employees, then the next people will come false taxi drivers. And if that happens, you'll find 650 dead politicians very quickly around the vicinity of Westminster. <laughs> Well, 650 minus the Sinn Féin ones that are smart enough to not turn up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, of course. Um, uh, and, and I should, should note that, like, even though uh, Deliveroo uh, earlier this, this year bravely promised to, like, pay their, like, riders minimum wage after their personal expenses, um, which, you know, sounded good for, for, for the PR bit, but as it turned out later, that was only during the time while the riders were actively out delivering an order, and that excluded the waiting time at the restaurant. So it's only literally oh, the, the, the Norman Tebbit time of being on your bike. Um, that that you get paid the minimum wage. Um, but yeah, David, since since you mentioned uh, uh, Burger King and the um, uh, non compete clauses, yeah. So like I said, those have mainly been like eliminated because they don't really exist anymore. Um, but this is in the US. But you know, it's it. I have no doubt it's gonna it's gonna make its way over here. Um, so the the new hotness in like about. nothing bad has ever started in the US and made its way over to the UK. <laughs> um, no, specifically, Telf Island has never had that problem. <laughs> um, yeah, no. The, specifically, the, the the new hotness in like screwing over your workers are so called stay or pay clauses. Um, they, 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 again, this mainly in the US at the moment, but, but according to an article in the New York Times, I read this does affect almost like a third of all workers in the US by now. It's hard to tell because all these contracts are obviously private, but like we're talking about a third. So like stale pays are like... Is this re- like you have to pay to quit your job? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fit your own so like, yeah, paying shit. <laughs> they're literally called trap clauses. Like I can't remember what the acronym is, but it's... Uh, it, they, they yeah, they're call called... Uh, it's, it stands for Training Repayment Agreement, which is uh, delightful. They're literally called trap clauses. Oh, fuck off. That is insane. Um, yeah, really, basically, really I, mean, I mean, the, the basic concept has been around in like high-end white-collar jobs for like a while, where it's not t- 
totally unreasonable. It's like if you go to your employer and you say, hey, I want to do like an insanely expensive like MBA or something. And then the company says, well, okay, and we'll pay for it. But then you have to like agree to remain here and use what you've learned for the company for a few years, which is like, you know, it's a, it's a thing. I think but that like, is unreasonable. I disagree with you entirely. <laughs> I mean, but you can understand why I think those you should courses... be allowed. You should be allowed to do a really expensive college course at your employer's expense, and then punch your boss and jump like jump out the door and run. <laughs> yeah, you were allowed to do it to Tony Blair, so why yeah. not your boss? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, now you've convinced protected me. By like one of the amendments, let's say the third. <laughs> <laughs> So, like in in those circumstances, he's been like these these things have existed uh, for, for like a while now. He's googling the Third Amendment right now. <laughs> no, yeah. no soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think that sounds right, mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you can't quarter yeah, your boss in your house. <laughs> Um, so like, uh, but like I said, so these have been relatively like standard in high paying jobs, uh, but now um, included in like the same kind of work now are uh, the, the New York Times listed among other like categories where they found these contract uh, contracts, uh, dog groomers, beauticians, firefighters, roof, roofers and social workers uh, who, who now have have these clauses. Um, so yeah, like and like James was saying, they're called now um, training repayment agreements or traps, which basically says that any form of on-the-job training you do is like monetized against you, and if you quit early, you have to pay it back. So which if is you're just... a sandwich artist, right? Yes, and you get taught the delicate art Ugh. of assembling bread into interesting shapes with wonderful fillings. Um, that that counts as training that you can be then you know forced to pay up for apparently because you could yes. learning, to learning how to test light isosceles triangles that cost at least three thousand dollars. James, you know what? you're contractually obligated to say eat fresh here. By the way, just I'm making sure that you fulfil that contractual <laughs> obligation after using the term sandwich artist. Uh, well, they did they did drop that one after uh, a spokesperson problem, some controversy. Don't know. Um, probably wasn't really important. Um, but no, but the whole logic is you could go down to another sandwich shop down the street, which let's be real is probably still a subway, and uh, take that skill set there. And this is just totally sane, normal stuff, right? That makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and basically like it's 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 up to the like employer to decide how much like your training is worth to them uh because they write well, it into like it your, your your employment agreement um and these cases are usually like enforced by private arbitration and not the court system mm -hmm. and private arbitration is really like very famous for never agreeing with an employee and with an employee like they they, yeah. they all yeah. should basically like you know they're just set up to fuck you over basically um what you should do is start a fire before you quit <laughs> <laughs> what destroy the records <laughs> yeah yeah but then well, you just can't go and work for billy joe <laughs> <laughs> just take the uh, take, take the cash register with you <laughs> yeah just like be tipping a can of petrol like all over the sound the sandwich shop going this is now year zero while we're throwing matches into it <laughs> it's, an, it's an interesting it's an interesting like gambit to try in the courts. Like you're spilling petrol on the sandwich as you're making it, and going, "Well, clearly the training wasn't worth very much. I wasn't well trained." Like, sure, mm. all right, let's try it. It sounds like Sam Bagman freed defending himself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, so that 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 them's your your news nuggets. So one of the reasons, apart from you know her her delightful presence, uh, that we asked Juliet on is uh, you know as as she stated before, is to just sort of kind of scream incoherently um, about the discourse these days. Uh, so that means um, and coherently. Let's be fair. Yeah. Uh. Is <laughs> well, we do try to form sentences around our screaming. So you know, <laughs> I don't know if that's actually productive, but. Um, no, it's because we are going to spend some time talking about um, the UK and uh, the ongoing genocide in Gaza, and it's the the discourse which which gets ever more noble and like, um, well, and Juliet, uh, uh, you know, I think a couple of years ago now, five years ago or something, I think Juliet, you like you wrote a really good piece about what it's like to go to Israel and 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 visit briefly. 
um, Palestine and like how to how to deal with that. I think maybe he's, I don't know how to, yeah. how to how to describe it. Six years ago, yeah, twenty seventeen, I I visited and wrote that. Um, I don't know whether we should talk about it now or come back to that a bit later, but um, yeah, it's, cool. you know, I I saw that um that interview with Tarnahisi Coates where he talks about. Well, once you go to the West Bank, we go to the occupied territory, you stop thinking this is in any way complicated and realize it's actually incredibly simple. Um, and I, sp- I spent three hours in Hebron and Al-Khalil um, and I was just absolutely appalled by it. It was like the worst, it was the worst thing I'd ever seen. Um, so yeah, maybe we should come back to that in a bit. But um, yeah. yeah. Can I just check before we get going? Should I get rid of this little octopus plushie I've got sat on my desk right now? With I, that is where I wanted to start because, like, <laughs> fuck, I is that really not thought that, that, like, yeah, we'd, we'd reach some kind of discourse, Nadir, but then, of course, I remembered that this is Britain and no such thing is ever get possible. Worse, Rob. Come on, yeah. Um, I just, yeah. I mean, I, I, I live in, 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 in hope and that is, you know, a stupid emotion, but. We're um, more than three years on from Cleanergate. I mean, you know. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> oh. I wonder if all the people affected have recovered from their rending of garments and flesh. <laughs> yeah. Saraditum, if you're listening, I hope you're okay. Actually, I hope you're not. Fuck you. Um, no, the, the, I hope yeah. your husband is still sitting playing the PlayStation. <laughs> yeah, and ignoring and, and ignoring. Yeah, for you. anyone who doesn't Wait. know who Sarah Ditton is, log on to yogscastwiki.com forward slash Sarah Ditton. <laughs> <No more>. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so this is the the the, the, the t- today's is it today's madness or has it been two days now? I've I've really lost uh, like Rob, track it's been of a time. sort of burbling madness that sort of been <laughs> below and then above the surface ever since probably about twenty fifteen, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 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 like you know, much like a Lovecraft story, like today's horror took the shape of like an octopus. Um it's it's right. So maybe if people listen to this like in 6 weeks or something and like I don't know, everything's more insane. It's basically what happened is like there was an episode of University Challenge, I think like yesterday or some shit. And one of the competing teams, uh, Christchurch College, I want to say Oxford, um, is had like a little little octopus, uh, like a little because they all have, I don't know. I mean, Juliet, you 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 were on uh, um, University Challenge, you know what much more than my, me. But like, it's quite common for like teams to like bring like a little fluffy toy, like a mascot or something, right? Yeah, well, yeah. Cheating was he there to predict the answers? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Sorry, Judy. Yeah, um, yeah. I did not have Paul the psychic octopus with me when I was on. Uh, that's why we didn't win. Uh, but yeah, that's that's quite a common thing to just take a little mascot. I mean, we didn't because of COVID. We were all behind uh, plastic screens, so we couldn't even you know sit undivided from each other. Um, so I wasn't able to take my um, you know big uh, big model of Lenin that I brought back from the Eastern Bloc. But, um... <laughs> what if you uh, what if what if you put a mask on him though? <laughs> that would be fine. I, I think so, yeah, as long as he wasn't spreading you know, If you put a mask or... on him and a poppy, it would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> what if I put a mask and a big yellow cape on him? What then? Um... <laughs> is the mask upside down? This is crucial. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, again, I mean, much, you know, I'm going to do this again, but I don't remember signing an NDA. Um, but when I got invited onto um, onto University Challenge, as well as being told that previous guests included uh, politicians like Boris Johnson and Michael Gove and journalists <laughs> such as uh, David Aranovich and Jonathan Friedland. Um, for the <laughs> grace of God. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, I mean, First I, thing I you did was go it. out and buy a cool leather jacket. Well, exactly. Um, I mean, I agreed to do it primarily because a couple of friends said to me, you don't have to have opinions, so I think you should do it. Um, and we need more TV shows where no one has opinions. Um, so I did that. <laughs> and in the end, the team I was on was, was all right. Actually, everyone was pretty sound. Um, but we got, you know, before we, before we traveled to, um, to Salford Keys, we got a protocol from the producer of the show. It's actually ITV produced the show. Oh, no, um, the BBC, BBC show it. So, you know, 
all the angry octopus people stay are kind of yelling at the wrong people anyway. Um, <laughs> which, you know, of course they are. Uh, but they sent something stipulating what you're allowed to wear and, you know, clothing you're allowed to wear is not allowed to have any kind of image, symbol, text, anything on it. Um, and I really, you know, because I mean, I, um, you know, well, I was in my late 30s and living in London and working in the arts. So my primary concern at all times is like, how can I prove how cool I am? Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I really wanted to wear, you know, a kind of obscure post-punk band t-shirt because like that would have been cool. Um, but that wasn't allowed. Are you allowed um, to wear like a, a placard that says no further questions? <laughs> <laughs> you lose the show if you do that. Um, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, I wasn't allowed to wear anything political. Um, I did do a, a kind of raised fist salute when saying goodbye. Um, and I was worried about even that, but, like, nobody really seemed to notice, or at least nobody who would, like, yell at me or the BBC about it. So that was good. A couple of my friends were like, yeah, nice one, good. Um, we ended up losing the final. Um, and before the final, uh, there was a little argument with uh, with Jeremy Paxman, who was, you know, annoyed at, uh the lockdown uh happening again because it was during another lockdown um and i just sat out of it i was like yeah i retired from arguing about politics at the 10th uh, 10 p.m on the 19th of december 2019 i'm staying out of this um no 12th of december um <laughs> didn't give another that advice week. none of us ever uh, took yeah well quite <laughs> um so i stayed out of uh paxman like arguing with the other team about um boris johnson I presume um, he just asked the same lost. question over and over, right? That's, well, exactly, that's yeah. <laughs> Will you condemn her mass? I was like, why keep asking me this? And, um, so, yeah, it was an interesting experience. But, yeah, I managed not to say anything anti-Semitic on the show, which, you know, given that I just campaigned for Jeremy Corbyn, is, is a real shock even to me. Um, <laughs> but here we are. Yeah. I mean, certainly here we are, because apart from, from the octopus thing, which I, I just, I, I've been just been genuinely baffled by by like the the level of insanity of 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 this i mean i know it's been like a thing well, yeah, before, because but like, like they they accused greta thunberg of doing that and so now they have to accuse everyone else who's even remotely like knows what an octopus is just so it seems like they weren't clutching at straws the first time yeah marine biologists <laughs> you're on notice yeah <laughs> well you expect what? james to have their electric cut off at any moment <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so uh, discourse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, of course, that was the only highlight. The other one is, of course, that um, uh, y y you might think that, you know, from from the images and, and videos and stories that we, we hear out of Gaza, that, you know, they're, they're having a very difficult, life-threatening um, time. Uh, and, and that might be true. But, of course, the most threatened people in 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 the world, I think, really, not just society, but the world, really, um, are Labour MPs. Because uh, they didn't yeah. want... Yes. yes. It's Labour conference forever, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, yeah. a call to arms to outlaw atting an MP. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird. It comes from all the same people as well. Um, yeah, but uh, anyway, basically... Oh, that, little, uh, that little at symbol's basically got a tentacle on it. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> you can't spell anti-Semitic without at. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Can confirm. Yeah, um, yeah basically, it's so thinking what like that, that's going to lead us to like cancel the Empire Strikes Back. I'm fine with that, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically what happened is like I mean there was a, a, a vote it has something to do with the King's speech and I don't care about the mechanics or whatever um, but there was an amendment by the SP that said basically the UK will commit itself to a ceasefire it used the word ceasefire um, of course you know Labour abstained on it like a bunch of cowards apart from about 50 MPs who were not such cowards um, you know which are they pretty... still Labour MPs? <laughs> and Jeff yeah, Phillips who is who is <laughs> A fucking coward, and only re and only fucking uh, voted in favour of that amendment because she realised that there are Muslims in her constituency. 
and they were nice to her about uh, the things that. Oh yeah, I have her. I have the text of the tweet she sent afterwards. Like, yes, she did resign. So you know, she don't wor- yeah, yes. don't worry, everyone. Jess Phillips hasn't grown a spine. She's just grown no, 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 a no, careerism. No. Can we give her the Lib Dem spine? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, They're no, not she, using it, course... are they? I mean, like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, she, of course, went to, on to, you know, condemn the vicious abuse hurled at Labour MPs, blah de blah blah and then, of course, took to Twitter to say, if, if my constituents had shouted and raged at me, the outcome, i.e. my vote, might have been very different. They didn't. They, they sat down and had cups of tea and thoughtful chats. It's like it's literally, uh, it's, literally that fu- <sighs> it's literally that fucking web comic about uh, the fucking Nazi being like, oh, well, if you weren't shouting and being rude to me, uh, I, uh, reasonable I would have Hitler. to do this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I mean that as well. Mm. But like, I mean, yeah, oh, no, another one you mean? It's, yeah, it's the British discourse sort of boiled down to its just essentials, isn't it? Like, be polite to me, or I'll like vote for genocide. I mean, it's just fucking incredible. <laughs> Just... And I might do it anyway. If I exactly. feel like it. Yeah, like... <laughs> and also, I like. I really like and then this blame one because it's for like not being nice enough. Yeah. Because like, if you if you are <laughs> polite to your MP, and you know, you sent like an email registering your strong concerns, which you know, hundreds of thousands of people did. Um, then it, it's like, oh no, actually that doesn't matter. Like you know, because because then you can be safely ignored because like you didn't make your voice known. It's like it's a complete lose lose of a situation. Yeah, um... They were there. There were supposedly like, Labour MPs at the night of the vote. Was supposedly talking about how like um, uh, working out like what percentage of their their constituents were yeah. like Muslims and they could afford to lose by like not voting for a ceasefire. Yeah, that was but, uh, that. I mean, that Twitter, came from Twitter is an absolute godsend for MPs because like that whole thing where it's like, well, we'd listen to reasonable concerns. But, do you know what I mean? We're not going to listen to abuse. And it's like, well, Twitter is just like an endless fountain of abuse, no matter what. So you've always got an excuse to just vote for you, like with your wallet or whatever, because you can always say, well, you know, I might have listened to the reasonable concerns of the like people being like uh, genocided. But, you know what I mean? Like fucking Rangers fan 1488 on Twitter, like <laughs> some fucking very harsh language towards me. And I'm, I'm, I just will not stand for that level of abuse. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it was... You it say was, that you can vote with your wallet, but I've not got mine back from the inspectors yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's but journalists yeah, this was the, <laughs> this was the This was the... That was... That was... Came from, from Alex Nunn, and I think it was later, like, confirmed by one of the other... One of the journalists working for Navarra, that, like, they... That, like, some MPs were literally told that, like, oh, no, you don't need to vote for a ceasefire because, like, there's only 7,000 Muslim voters in your community and, like, you can just afford to lose all of them and still win by the margins we, pre- we predict. So, like, it's fine. And, like, what are just they going to do? Let's vote just... for someone else? And let's just call this what it is. It is rank Islamophobia in no yeah. uncertain oh, yeah. terms. Like, it's, it's just... just it's... <laughs> It's amazingly reductive because the assumption that it's only the Muslims that are going to vacate, you know, vacate voting for them because of the stance on genocide, I think is going to be the ultimate in hubris come next mm. election. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean they've it. already done the sums to take all the socialists off. Yeah, I mean, look. Uh, 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 anyway, it doesn't really matter because, like, if 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 we don't vote and none of us fucking will vote for for Labour, but still, uh, if we don't, it's all TikTok's fault because TikTok is run by the by the Chinese mm. and and oh, the yeah. Iranians. Yeah, and you know, like anyone under thirty five is basically <laughs> well, a zombie. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah the yeah. Iranians. Also there'll running a, TikTok. There'll be a world world leading nuclear power any day now. <laughs> I mean, inshallah, they will be. But... Two great tastes that taste great together, you know. <laughs> They've got those underground reactors, you see, where they're producing, like, the fucking enriched uranium. Yeah, I'm pretty sure one of them got blown up, Jamie. Um, we might have covered it in a previous episode. No, those are, those <laughs> are, di- those, those are different uh, reactors. Those are the ones that also produce the uh, Hamas super soldiers, and they could take the same tunnel system all the way from Tehran all the way down to uh, the Gaza Strip. Oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, it's it, oh, yeah. So anyway, so th- this vote happened. Most of the Labour MPs abstained, and then you know the the Green Party of England and Wales, a, a party with you know certain amounts of troubles of its very own, uh, don't get too enthusiastic about the, those guys. But they did, you know, just publish a list saying this is how everybody voted, and these are their names. You know, it's it's these yeah, standards function. Say what you like about the Green Party. At least all their MPs voted the same way. 
Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they, they said this is a list of people who, who who failed to vote to stop genocide or, or stop the killing. Words like that, and then Caroline fucking Lucas backpedaled yes. away from it incredibly hard, saying, "Oh, I had nothing to do with this wording. I wouldn't have approved this wording. It caught me by surprise. Please, please, I'm yeah. a good girl." It's just like, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had principles if I'd known they were going to be like reacted to. <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah this specific it was even worse than that though. No, it was, nobody, yeah, it was nobody told invoking... me i would be expected to like support my principles what the fuck yeah <laughs> it was worse than that though because she was straight up invoking fucking joe cox like you can't yeah, share lists was. of names of how people voted because oh, joe cox might sick. happen again yeah like, i mean i off, i voted for caroline lucas i think twice um and at the time obviously i was, was quite pleased when she got in and uh have felt less good about it ever since I found out she was the person who came up with the name People's Vote. Yep. Was that her? <laughs> that was her, yeah. Oh, She's got a lot Jesus. to answer for. As, yeah. as opposed to whose vote? <laughs> well, <probably>. <laughs> <laughs> um, never I mean, <laughs> oh, no, obviously, I'm, I'm, that's a silly question because obviously it's as opposed to the referendum. <laughs> <laughs> well, you tell him that you can't go skiing next year. Um, Happily. <laughs> it's also, I mean, she was, you know, in Parliament during all the, the Brexit votes, she was fucking screwing around with politics um, yeah. just because anything to avoid letting Labour have a win, nothing about like the actual effects. It's just it's fucking galling. It wasn't about Brexit, it was stopping. A bad case of the Jerumbly Crumblies. That's what we mm. had to avoid. No, she was the person I get somewhat during like the height of the all the votes and like sort of the the block parliament and the madness who suggested that like uh, she should be caretaker PM of like a cabinet oh, of yeah, like all girl cabinet bosses. Time, is it? Cabinet of white mm. women, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was only white women as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now she it's like she apologized See, to Angela Eagle. That's it. it that, which was like just, a. a, a and a cabinet of entirely white women is never going to go over on Twitter. You need to at least include, like, Brian Cox and fucking Gary Lineker. <laughs> Otherwise, like, the public just aren't going to vote for it, you know? Uh, I think Gary Lineker's out now. Yeah, um, I was going to say, I don't think you're going to get Gary Lineker passed anymore. Like, that, that he's, he's, uh, he shared a tweet by Owen Jones. So, you know, it's, it clearly yeah. he's... Uh... Alain de Botton is no longer calling for him to lead a party called Centre Forward, you know? It's... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All of this shit is just burned into my fucking brain, man. Like, yeah. I don't know how long I'm going to live and, you know, who knows after enduring all of this. But, you know, maybe in, like, I don't know, what, 40, 50 years time, I'll be on my deathbed. And all I'll be able to do is just say, like, fucking the Nando's UK. photo. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sam, it's, it's very optimistic of you to assume that you'll be able to afford a deathbed. Well, there. quite. Yeah. All yeah. right. Well, in my death ditch. Um, yeah. <laughs> ditch luxury. <laughs> After Keir, <laughs> after Keir Starmer's grandson has run me over in his fucking monster uh -huh. truck. Um, yeah. As I'm on my way to, like... Re recline, re reclining in my palliative care void. Deliver some fucking <laughs> soil of green to some, like, people living in fucking Chester Terrace next to Regent's Park. <laughs> <laughs> Despite not being able to cycle anymore because I've fucked up both of my legs trying to have a football career in my early thoughts. like... She's <laughs> 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 uh, not been able to cycle anywhere because of all the fucking, like, uh, SUVs driven by, like, uh, Keir Starmer's AI yeah. children. Well, you know, you know I live in this constituency, right? I mean... Um, well, yeah, you're the most at danger. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Half of the delivery drivers. <laughs> I've, I've been to the pub that he left and, you know, hit the delivery driver after. So, yeah. <laughs> In investigated the inst instant, though, yeah. <laughs> sort of forensic architecture, but for just, like, British political detritus. <laughs> 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 Reconstructing whether or not David Cameron did actually fuck that pig. <laughs> and I mean, the answer is, of course he did. Fucking look at him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, of course, the whole thing then immediately devolved into, I mean, the Greens did share that list, which was, you know, undoubtedly cool and good, and also, like, literally just a record. It's like, you know, one of the basic functions of this shambles of the democracy is that, like, at least you get to see how the people you, you know, elect, quote-unquote, vote in public, because, you Yeah, know, well, frankly, that's just abusive, and they should, st they should take away that right, you know? Well, I was mm -hmm. remembering, I like, a few... It was a few years ago during the last time, like, everybody was really fucking furious at MPs that, like, 
what I think it was a Tory back at the time saying that like they should like block access to Hansard, like where the folk yeah. record is kept, for like because then the, 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 the scummy public could see it and that would be better and safer. They work for you, brackets Hamas. Oh, that was it. <laughs> that was it. They wanted to block the website they work for you because like it it, it gave people like, you know, with their tiny furious brains too much information they couldn't really process. So like they want to block their work mm-hmm. for you. That was it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it only tell it only tells you how the MPs voted. It doesn't give you the context of their very good reasons why. Yeah, all that home yeah, it should, what it should do is when you go onto Charlotte Nichols uh, voting record, it should say, actually I'm very working class and did all of these awful votes with a heavy heart. That way you get the full picture. Yeah. That's on they say, explain I, I themselves didn't read, to you. Yeah. I didn't read the leaflets before I like handed them out. <laughs> mm, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then of course Keir Starmer came out and said that like it, ever since the vote his family was God, threatened. Just, sorry, it's like diatribe, but do you remember that time um on Twitter when I like fucking got Charlotte Nichols to block some like random fucking centrist dad guy by faking a tweet <laughs> and him and his mates went at me for like a week and a half. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing times. God's work, Jamie, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's anyway, all, it's all about that annoyance to effort ratio. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah it really is. <laughs> yeah, but then, of course, Keir Starmer was just like, no, in the, again, I, it, not to belabor the point too much, but in the context of seeing babies outside incubators and people being blown up and, you know, the, the, the worst amount of child casualties in decades in, like, the, the, I don't know, I, I, I've seen a bunch of graphs. It's just horrifying. That fucking ham weasel cunt who can't bring himself to call for a ceasefire to say, actually, it's my family being threatened. It's just like, Did he mistake th- them for delivery drivers? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah fucking, his family just- being fre- threatened, like... Like, these people should feel fear that if they vote for genocide, that maybe uh, they shouldn't <laughs> for reasons. The the main reason his family feel threatened is probably because he has, like, seven pints and then drives home. <laughs> 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 While listening to Three Lions by Skinner Badil and yeah. the Lightning <laughs> Really captured the mood of the nation at the time, don't you think? Just sort of, squinting, up, squinting, through, squinting through the windscreen and going, but those handlebars always po- poking over the bumper. <laughs> yeah, but he'd have to he'd have to focus group afterwards to decide what types of pints he was having in the pub before he got home. <laughs> <laughs> the the thing is, he doesn't actually know the reality of what's going on in Palestine. That's that's really why he won't vote for a ceasefire. He's heard that they're digging up a big mass grave for the hospital. And he just thinks, well, that's value for money. The NHS should also have such things. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure West Streeting's reforming it as we speak. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, anyway, so it wasn't just Labour. It was also the uh, the Tories that were added. This is the, I think, I'm fairly sure that Gillian Keegan is the Minister for Schools at the moment, saying that um, I'm deeply concerned that some <laughs> children are attending political protests during a school day even more if they are taking part in or being exposed to anti-Semitic chants. So any of the so, chants then, yeah. So yeah. She was, she was the one... The planet. Was she the one that got caught, like, fucking crying about how she was doing so no one ever says she's doing a good job? Like, uh, about I the think, school roofs yeah. falling in. Oh. Well, you know, I'd like to congratulate her on surviving the reshuffle then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, she was the one who who uh, who who. It, that was about the the, the collapsing schools, about the uh, reinforced yeah. autoclave concrete uh, stuff. That yeah, that she was the only one who was doing something. Fuck, how <laughs> Jesus, how dare you? Like, I, just going around gorgeous. schools putting up scaffolding herself. <laughs> it could all. I mean, it could all. You know, just just turn out to be terrorist scaffolding, of course, um, yeah. because ho- hospitals in. And also, by extension, um, Médecins Sans Frontières, um, the United Nations, the BBC, Channel 4, and the Red Cross, um, they've all been taken over by Hamas supporters, so we can no longer trust yeah. them. That's, that's, that was this, this week's new line as well. I, I, the lev- the, the I level mean- of debasement and dehumanization you have to engage in to, like, look, have problems with the United Nations as an organization. By all means, but to say that they've been taken over by Hamas, I mean, are you this was, out um, of your fucking this, this mind? Was, this was from that fucking Borat 2 writer, wasn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Oscar nominated. Oh, not just. Yeah. There was quite a few. Um, yeah. Dan Hodges, returning fucking champion. <laughs> Fuck me. Was he at it? Oh, yeah, he was at it's it as well, it. yeah. On a, yeah. On a yeah, sort it's... of... Apropos of nothing, are we doing comment or commentary at tonight? Yes. Oh, we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little, a little treat for our beloved guest. Cool. <laughs> it's just... It, like, the dis... It, I, I swear to God, like, I... I Every time I think it gets, you know, I know we will never reach the bottom because, you know, because neoliberalism keeps existing. So therefore, you know, the stakes of the propaganda war must be upped every time to, like, get people to still to still react. Um, but, like, it, they, they're they assaulting hospitals now and then, like, putting out, like, propaganda videos of saying, well, we found seven AKs and, like, one piece of body armor in, in I mean, but the, no tunnels. Wanna- I just want to add, Rob, like, you say there are certain hospitals now. They have been, like, yeah, sorry. this yeah, entire yeah. time. Like, like yeah. no, so we went from, uh, oh, maybe they bombed this hospital, but actually uh, it was probably Hamas because of, uh, because of rockets, uh, which up until now have mostly just done, like, fucking cosmetic damage to buildings. Yeah, that level of hospital, we've gone from that level of having to uh, cover, like, Israel feeling like, or the, you know, the IDF having to cover its ass. To uh, actually, no, we are we are assaulting these hospitals, and it's good, actually. Like, it's... no, that's you're just falling for uh, UN propaganda. Quite frankly, we need another JC <laughs> Denton to sort them out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Luke Akers, I didn't realise you were on tonight. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> now nah, it's just yeah. I mean, and, and speaking of like the latest sort of, I can't even begin to talk about it, but like. The Israelis now saying that like the Khan Yunis hospital in southern Gaza is now the headquarters and not the Shifa hospital in northern Gaza. Like they're just gonna, you know, first northern Gaza it's, was the Hamas headquarters and now it's in the yeah, south. They're just gonna keep it going the, until and the, all the shit they're doing in the West Bank now. Like yeah, 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 yeah. notably not even under the control of you know, scare quotes, control of Hamas. But uh it's, it's, you know it's it's straight up, sorry, marry over princesses in another castle, except it's, sorry, global community, it turns out that Hamas is under another hospital. It's just going to repeat doing it, because they don't care. Well, it works, so... Yeah. Yeah, they'll keep doing it till they get told to stop. You know. And then that fucking desiccated, dying skeleton of Joe Biden's going, oh yeah, no, this is fine, I agree with them. I, I've seen the evidence, you know. I pr- Presumably, I've also seen the Orville brothers take the first flight, but, you know, like, this... <laughs> You know, by the way, who is hilariously behind in all the polls now, and you know, you know they're going to say, "Well, it, it, it's just because TikTok again." You know, it, it, and Susan Sarandon, you. yeah, yeah, just fucking. I did. I'm really losing my capacity to 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 speak about it. The only sort of brief highlight in terms of you know the, which was horrible propaganda, but of the much more funny variety. Um, I think that was last week. That was and it was Breitbart, so like it was terrifically no. you know serious to be taken seriously, of course. Um, oh yeah, but the was, um, fucking fentanyl laced rockets as well. That's a, that's yes, a the fentanyl th- that Hamas was filling rockets with fentanyl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, that is fine. I thought we were going to talk about the cum. Oh, we can talk God. about cum. We, <laughs> we, we can talk that about the cum for a <laughs> <laughs> We can talk about the cum for a bit. There's like cum retrieval units or something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like the Space Marines will do in the 41st century, according to one scholar I saw online. <laughs> <laughs> Which You're scholar? talking about that guy, um, a distressing amount lately, Jamie. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. <laughs> Because <laughs> people like it's just all over the fucking like uh, feed on Blue Sky constantly. <laughs> not not a fucking not a day goes by oh, without someone asking, without someone asking the cursed <laughs> question. Sorry, who's the human pet guy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we haven't got Lionel, so we can't go too much into the into the theme of types of guy. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, fucking All Christ. of this discourse is just yeah, fucking but, insane. Like, none of it makes any fucking sense. Listener, if you haven't heard what uh, the the backstory to what we were just talking about, uh, supposedly there is a unit in the IDF that rushes out to uh, dead IDF soldier bodies to, and apparently I'm not making this up, to extract their cum <laughs> for the families and relatives that have been left behind. <laughs> to enjoy. 
<laughs> they do this listener by sticking basically a cattle prod up their ass and forcing a mechanical contraction to expel it, which they have to do within three hours of death, otherwise the sperm is non-viable. <laughs> so you've got you know how we joked previously about those like uh plasterers who would like abseil down the building and like hit go at a moment's notice you know the idf actually has that but for dudes who jack off corpses so I I, 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 i'm just really liking the idea of you know how the americans do that stupid thing where they like fold a flag and then present it to the widow it's like they fold an israeli <laughs> flag but that also pretend like give you a tiny jar of cum it's just a good... with a my little pony in it <laughs> 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 oh god what i love about this story actually is so you might be thinking surely it would be more efficient just to have the soldiers jack off and then store their sperm and like you know freeze it because it can't be that hard um, that would require the soldiers consent <laughs> well so it would require consent but also and this is real um, the Israeli army is so well provisioned that they have like a surplus of military command and so they need to give them all something to do. And minding the freezers is not as heroic as like, you know, fucking helicopter abseiling onto the battlefield to extract a soldier's semen. Like, um, so so that's why they genuinely, they, they, they have like so many commanders and generals that they have like a much smaller army than the United States, but something ridiculous <laughs> like 75% the number of like generals and commanders. It's nuts. Oh, good. So, Everyone knows what makes an army effective is an officer class that's too big. Mm. <laughs> you get like a different stuff, but you can call yourself General Cum Cap and just start running, <laughs> running around. <laughs> But there is, there is literally some, like, there's some officer somewhere who's, like, very important, whose job is, hey, you're there to go milk the cum from the dead bodies. And he's like, yes, this is serving my country. Like, <laughs> fuck. Listen, James, all officers are very important. Every one of them is told that as soon as they get their commission. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> moving on very slightly. From, <laughs> from the yeah, forget from forget about the come. We need to move on from the come. Yeah, <laughs> uh, is uh, I do briefly, uh, uh, Julia. I want to talk about. Your road experience, like what you saw in your um, the article that you wrote for for swimmers, um, we Jesus, talked about it earlier. It's a fucking it's, segue. I know. I'm what sorry. a fucking what a pivot! <laughs> like. Yeah, can we just talk a I will apologise. <laughs> we can just blame it on the IDF. It's fine. Yeah, exactly. And they'll uh, blame it on Hamas. Yeah. So you know. Um, yeah. Ultimately, the UN carries the can. Well, exactly, yeah. and you know that's mm, full of yeah. Hamas. So yeah. Yeah, Gre um, Greta Thunberg. See what you made us do. Like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so so yeah i mean i um i out of kind of a mixture of a little bit of curiosity and a large amount of just ignorance really um i agreed to go to play in a lgbt uh sports tournament in israel in 2017 and i was asked to go by the um gay football team i was playing for at the time um in east london and kind of thought it would be interesting and there's kind of the point where the writer in me and the sort of you know politically engaged more activistic side of me kind of clash because the writer side of me is always like we'll just go and do something because it will just be interesting and something to write about and experience and obviously the political side of me is much more like well don't do this for these reasons um and out of out of like i said out of ignorance really and, and not really having engaged with the issue as much as i should have done i agreed to go um, so we went and stayed in uh, Tel Aviv in March 2017. There was six of us, I think. You know, the first thing you notice is the immigration policy, uh, or just the border policy at uh, Ben Gurion Airport. I got through fine. Um, one of my teammates had a Muslim-sounding name, and so he got taken aside for a while uh, and was in a room uh, with a load of Palestinian women who'd been locked in there for hours with the guards telling them that they, they couldn't find anyone to cover them while they took these women to the toilets, so they'd have to just stay there. Um, so you get an example of a sort of petty cruelty uh, that mm. just runs through, uh, runs through the whole, whole system uh, as, soon as, as soon as you touch down. 
uh, in Israel. And, they and we know you... that was a lie because there had to be at least seven captains doing nothing at that time. Well, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> just, you know, just dressing up as a general and cap. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> You know, so 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 that was that was the sort of first thing, first thing I saw, and they give you they give you a slip with your details on it rather than a stamp in your passport because obviously if you get an Israeli stamp in your passport, it sort of knocks out about you know a huge number of other countries that you then just can't go to. Um, so I kept that kept that on me for the whole time. I mean, it's sort of notable that I can't really remember much about the football tournament itself because we were the only international team there as it turned out uh and i sort of found out later by asking around other teams sort of in the lgbt league in the uk that the reason why other teams hadn't gone was not because of a sort of politicized boycott but because they were just scared of going to the middle east they just thought the whole place was like a conflict zone um but i mean you know it does speak to the fact that people don't want to go to israel don't want to move to israel because it kind of is um yeah I mean, Tel Aviv yeah. was interesting because, I mean, you know, guiltily, I really liked the city. It's really interestingly designed. It's got incredible architecture. I mean, a lot of uh, Bauhaus um, architects moved there um, in the 1930s and, and designed some really astonishing buildings. Um, architecture is pretty extraordinary. Um, you know, you're on this, like, beautiful mediterranean sea and you can live in tel aviv and not feel the conflict too much i mean there's like military planes flying over you would periodically see people in military uniform and you know there's a square named after yitzhak rabin with a monument to him um so there are places where you feel it and if your eyes are remotely open then you will you will notice it you will feel it um but of course you know it is a place you can live and I don't know, become quite desensitized to it, uh, not really pay attention to it. The sports tournament, which could only have taken place in Tel Aviv, really, because when people talk about Israel being the the only LGBT-friendly country in the region, they're really only talking about Tel Aviv, I think. And even then, a certain kind of bubble of that. But, you know, we went to the training ground of uh, Benai Yehuda FC, and we played the tournament there. And there was um, an Israeli flag, a Union Jack, and uh, a rainbow flag up there. Which sort of struck me as weird, and you know the the football was was barely worth talking about. Like I said, I mean I read back over this piece just now, and saw that I scored a couple of goals, and we ended up winning one of the uh, trophies. And I, you know, I just couldn't tell you anything about it because really, what stuck with me more than anything was the day I went to Hebron and Al Khalil. Um, various friends of mine said, "Look, if you go to Israel, then you have to go and see the West Bank. You know, you can't not do it." So the day before I went. I was in Tel Aviv and I went to the um, offices of Haaretz, which is, you know, Israel's most left-leaning paper. And, you know, while far from perfect, my feeling is that their coverage of the current conflict has been a lot better than anybody else's. And certainly yeah, I'd say less, so, yeah. less, than less insane Western than media. ours. Lots, yeah. lots well, the person I met up with there was Gideon Levy. I don't know if any of you have read him, but his book, um, The Punishment of Gaza, um, is very good at covering the beginning of the um, the blockade in the mid 2000s and basically his job is just to cover the blockade um you need permission to go and he would get permission um i had some quite interesting conversations with him and um he you know the first thing he said to me when i told him while i was in israel was did any of you consider a boycott and i talked about how British LGBT institutions, you know, often didn't really advance a kind of structural critique of the circumstances that they were fighting for equality in. Um, and, you know, obviously this was the case for, for me on this occasion, I have to admit. Um, but I sort of stayed talking to, to Levy um, and he thought I wanted to go to Gaza and he asked if I had a press card and told me I wouldn't get in. Um, so I said that I, I wanted to go to Hebron. He recommended a group called Break in the Silence who... I think was set up by the filmmaker Avi McGrabi, whose work is well worth watching. And he was involved with it as well. And they'd fix you up with a Palestinian family and sort of take you around and just show you around and explain to you the nature of the occupation. But they weren't running any tours mm -hmm. on the only day I had free. So I, I went on my own. I asked Levy about, you know, whether he got in trouble because of his writing. And he said, you know, 2017, he said only with members of the public, never the government. And he just said, we're not Turkey, not yet. And he, in the current um, 
current conflicts have been calling for a one-state solution quite a lot. And when I got the bus to um, Hebron from Jerusalem, I could see why. So you get the uh, the 405 bus, uh, and in the bus station there are all these uh, blister plaques with uh, uh, toy guns in them, uh, like the ones the IDF would use, uh, called um, just called Shooter, with a picture of a kind of like Muslim-looking man with a big beard on them, um, which is one of the just mm-hmm. little things that really gave me the measure of the society. So I got the bus... An economy based around early 2000s Flash games. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. And early 2000s War on Terror uh, discourse, which, uh, great combo, I think. Oof. But, um... Yeah. Yeah, so made my way over to um, to Hebron. Uh, and you just, you go past so many illegal settlements, um, which, you know, when you hear people talking about the need for a two-state solution, um, it's really notable. You know, no one's ever prepared to answer that question of what do you do about the settlements? Because there are so many of them. Uh, and they're huge and they're really fortified. Well, every, every day that goes by, the two-state solution becomes less and less and less viable politically or otherwise, yeah. right? Yeah, and it was completely implausible six years ago when I was there. Yeah. So I imagine it's, it's, it's got much further out of hand now. Um, so we passed. It's wild that British people won't talk about a two state solution considering how much historically they've enjoyed to draw lines on maps. Well, because quite, that's yeah. arguably easily the hardest part of the two state solution <laughs> is figuring out what bits of land belong to oh, which state. Oh, just stick a straight line to like, it, it'll whoa. be fine. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the traditional British, British answer to everything, yeah. Yeah. Well, so I got to Hebron. Uh, it was like early April, it was 35 degrees or something. It was so hot. Uh, the bus dropped me on the Israeli side, and there's this dirt track. This is nothing there. Couldn't see any civilians, just armed soldiers in armoured cars. And there was, I think, 1,500, maybe 2,000 IDF troops stationed there to protect 500 um, Israelis. Uh, and it was just honestly, you know, I sort of talked earlier about the fact that, and I think this ties in even to uh, the previous topic of conversation, which is that you know, the issue that Israel has is that people don't want to move there anymore. Like, people don't want to live yeah. there. I mean, um, well, well, and I mean, Hebron was... there, there are, like, some people who still want to move there, but, yeah. like, they're really the most disgusting people in the world. It's exactly. Like, I remember and that, even like, then, those, those videos of, like, Americans who moved over and, like, literally just, like, post these like instagram videos of like look i got a free house and like you can almost like see the like palestinian yeah. family crying outside it's the people I who mean, are still yeah, there are so just disgusting for, for for non kind of psychopaths you know i can see why you'd want to live in tel aviv as long as you could afford to live there and to a lesser extent jerusalem but anywhere else no and hebron absolutely not i mean i just got there and all i could see is these like concrete barricades and barbed wire protecting these you know unidentifiable buildings adorned with star of david graffiti and israeli flags um i think the most depressing thing i saw was a boarded up shop with these faded um boards across the top um two of them had arabic inscriptions um and then uh, there were these faded english language pepsi adverts saying have a good time that clearly had been there since 1967 i mean like really really pleased uh, and just like these feral Excellent. cats, just like fighting over a skit, and this was this was just awful. Uh, I mean, I walked around for a bit, so trying to keep out of the way of the soldiers who didn't really seem to kind of talk to each other. Even this air of paranoia around the whole place, and I ended up going to the Bite Hasada Museum, which is the um, museum about the history of Jewish life in Hebron. You know, this woman took me through the five rooms, and I thought, it's an Orthodox Jewish woman. And I thought, you know, there's no point having an argument about anything in this museum. Like, you know, if there are any kind of glaring omissions, she will know about them. She's not going to fix them. Certainly not going to fix it at my insistence. And, you know, again, the writerly part mm. of me sort of took over. It's like, well, look, you know, just see what's going on here and process it and write about it, which is, is you know, what I did when I got back to London. Um, but the second room uh, covered the events of 24th of August 1929, when amidst kind of wider unrest... Uh, There were rumours that the Jews were planning to take Temple Mount um, in Jerusalem. Uh, And local Arabs uh, rioted uh, and killed um, about 70 Jewish people, pillaged the houses and ransacked these synagogues. Um, And the British, you know, ever uh, ever the people you want around in such a situation, um, Mm -hmm. decided the thing to do was evacuate Hebron's entire Jewish population. Um, A lot of them went back in 1931, but left again. 
uh, the start of an Arab revolt in 1936 in which 300 Jews and 5,000 Arabs were killed. Uh, but there was no Jewish presence after that uh, until the Six Day War. Yeah. Um, I, I, so, I, 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 I found it a really interesting part of like your, your article that it, it's one of those things that, that you really touch on is like the, the British role in these things and that as usual, like British people have no memory of what we did and like w yeah. why and you know the, the just the, the complete lack of any follow through that like basically they just kind of just let everything fall completely to shit and then just turned around and went oh that's not our fault it, it yeah. yeah no i mean it's, it's just like don't worry about yeah. it don't worry yeah. about it it yeah. all turned out fine now to open this fresh newspaper to see what's going on in the world <laughs> exactly I mean, um, it does. It does make me think about you know because you, you get these extremely bad faith commentators saying, "Oh, why, why are uh, the British public not protesting this regime or that mm -hmm. regime?" And it's like, motherfucker, did did we like have an instrumental role in setting up all of these places? Sometimes, not a lot of the time, not. And also, Israel being a literal British ally to whom we supply arms, yeah, all the time mm -hmm. and have done for decades, provide pretty much you know unconditional rhetorical yeah. political and military support absolutely um yeah. which we don't do you know in syria or russia or you know whatever like yeah i mean it's yeah, yeah like you say about bad faith commentators if there are any other kind but um <laughs> no that's a bit unfair there's there's a handful of good people but, um, <laughs> there's, there's Jones is trying his hardest nesreen malik is good i mean there's there's a few people who are you know not completely terrible but anyway mm -hmm. um so you know there's 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 sort of Plenty about 1929. It doesn't mention the fact that you know local Arabs uh, apparently sheltered at least some of the remaining Jewish population then. Uh, but a more um, uncontestable omission, should we say, is the other massacre in Hebron in 1994, uh, when a man called Baruch Goldstein went to the uh, mosque yeah. in the cave of the patriarchs, opened fire um, on Purim Day, uh, and killed 29 Arabs. Um, there were five Israelis and 25 Palestinians killed in the ensuing riots. Uh, and there was a memorial to Goldstein um, in a nearby settlement that had been founded in 1968. Um, that I think was there until about 2010, I want to say. Um, so it was there for a long time. Um, so it's a very selective uh, history. And like I said, I, I didn't contest it because, you know, what's the point? Um, and yeah. rather, I decided to just go to the um, the Palestinian side of the city. So you had these 500 residents or so in Hebron. Al-Khalil, as the um, Palestinian side is called, has about, I think, a quarter of a million. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Under, you know, occupation. Um, you could go straight through the checkpoint um, if you want to get to Palestinian yeah. side. Yeah. No I find that so either. interesting that it was like more like a sort of a, like sort of just a turnstile basically that nobody really yeah. cared about. It's such an interesting, you know. I I, I well, did you know all borders are bullshit anyway, but just like the idea that you can walk into, I don't know either an occupied place or a separate nation or yeah, uh, you know, depending quite, on your quite yeah. possible that they just looked at me and thought you know this person isn't a problem. Uh, we can let this person through. Uh, but there was this incredibly jarring thing that, you know, usually when I've crossed borders, it's on land, which I haven't done very much. It's usually been the former Yugoslavia. Um, and, you know, they're often in the countryside. Um, I mean, I have crossed from Serbia to Kosovo since I wrote this article, um, which was a strange experience, but maybe one for another day. But you cross the line and you've got but like... Borders inside Yugoslavia aren't really... Well, anyway, exactly, it's yeah, it's, you know... Yeah, I'm not going to tell anyone I've met from the Balkans that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you, you cross a line here and you cross through the checkpoint. You've got like a different alphabet, different architecture. People kind of look and dress differently. And as you walk up to the checkpoint on the Israeli side, you have all these kind of like shut down buildings with Israeli flags and Stars of David daubed on them. Uh, you cross the line and the first three things I saw were a Palestinian flag uh, a shutdown building with boycott Israel graffitied on it in big red letters, uh, and a cafe named after uh, Rachel Corrie, who was killed by an Israeli bulldozer yeah. in Gaza yeah. in 2003, and uh, hard to remember now, but was the subject of a, a play co-written by uh, Kath Viner of uh, Guardian editing fame. Uh -huh. um, huh. But Al Khalil was was really busy, you know, like there's there's a lot of people there and people welcoming me uh, in English, and you could look up. 
because the Palestinian city is literally a level below Hebron. Um, so H1 is what they call Al Khalil, um, what the Israelis call it, and counted like 10 Star of David flags on the fence above, and people would throw rubbish through the fence onto the Palestinians. Uh, builders who were working See. there would like play Jewish folk songs so loud that the Arabs couldn't avoid hearing them. Um, but, you know, I, I, I walked around the old city, the Souk, um, and I've read before that, like, if you go on your own, um, local children will just kind of latch onto you and, and just show you around. And what they'll do is they'll keep taking you into, like, news agents and basically you buy drinks and they get a bit of commission if you buy, you know, a bottle of Coke or something. Uh, so I just mm-hmm. drank a lot. Um, but this kid, I mean, <laughs> my guess was he was about eight. Um, but a friend has said that the children there often look younger because of malnourishment. And sure enough, this kid took me to his house and showed me his mother, who just looked absolutely kind of exhausted, and his little brother and sister, who were toddlers, uh, who again just looked really kind of emaciated, uh, just playing in this like dust courtyard. Um, but he really wanted to have me on Facebook, um, which I, you know, didn't really think was a great idea because Facebook's terrible. Um, <laughs> but he took me up to his room. Uh... Can I just quickly add, like, what you know, you're talking about um, emaciated Palestinians. Like, this is again another part of uh, Israeli policy, right? It's uh, starvation mm. plus is how is uh, how I saw it phrased. Like, barely, yeah. barely above starvation, uh, food being allowed into the various places that they're occupying. I mean, that was certainly the impression I got. I mean, I think it's worse in Gaza, but um... yeah was certainly the feeling I got. But I mean, really what stuck with me more was, you know, going up to his bedroom. He opens his PC and the background image is three Palestinian Liberation Organization soldiers. And he's got a huge poster of Yasser Arafat on his wall. Um, And I'm not sure who I had on my wall when I was like eight or nine or 10. I mean, it's probably like England's 1990 World Cup squad or something. Um, So, you know, I just told him I wasn't on Facebook and went outside. Um, (laughs) And he sort of takes me... uh, takes you to meet a man with a van and then this this kid who like i said is you know certainly younger than teenage just jumps onto the um the driver's seat and holds the uh holds the steering wheel and like beckons me to get into the car and i was like am i going to accept a lift around a war zone from a child um yeah (laughs) decided that i would not um so we just went around started walking again i decided not to go into the mosque when it was closed for prayers anyway and these teenage boys just sort of took me around and just showed me where the Israeli occupiers would and wouldn't let them go. And then, you know, decided it was maybe time to leave at that point. Um, so I gave 10 shekels, about two pounds, to Kaltoon, this boy who was absolutely delighted and just gave me a hug. And then went back to the checkpoint. Uh, and then I had to buzz back through and give them this blue slip I'd got at the airport. Uh, they asked me where I was from, where I was staying, and then if I was Jewish. So I said, I'm from London, staying in Tel Aviv, and no, I'm not. Um, I'm not sure what they would have said if I'd said I was Jewish, but they let me back through. And I tried to go to the Cave of the Patriarchs to see what was there and headed towards the hill. Um, and this small girl just kind of came up to me and in English, just yelled, give me money. Um, and then these two armed guards stopped me and asked if I was Jewish. And I was like, no, I just want to get out of here. So just got the bus back to, um, to Jerusalem and then back to Tel Aviv, um, just feeling really kind of shaken and just really really appalled i mean it was just so hard to you know i've just given you the raw facts of of my kind of three yeah, hours it's, it's such a fucked vibe like, it's horrific i, I know that way. that's like the the most fucking base way to describe it and like I'm, I'm doing words no fucking service there with that but it is a really really fucked up vibe i just i can't even picture myself in a situation like that you know it's Oh. No, I mean I've never, I've never stopped it's thinking just, it's about fuck it. It's fucked to know that it's happening. And the, on, yeah. the only, yeah, other yeah, place, Christ, yeah. the only other place I've ever left feeling kind of equally shaken and, you know, disturbed was um, the following year. I I lived in Kiev for a summer doing a residency, and I went to um, Chernobyl and Pripyat, and you know, came out of there uh, feeling utterly mm. traumatized. That's the only comparable experience I've had. Jesus. Yeah. Really, really horrific. And, you know, like I said, a I glowing went, review. I went into it, you know, with that sort of liberal canard of like, oh, this is complicated. And, you know, 
there's something interesting about Israel uh, trying to be LGBT friendly and all of this. And I came out yeah. of it being like, you know, like 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 I said earlier, Tana Easy Coates says, you know, you, you come out of it just being firmly committed to the, you know, dismantling of the system of apartheid and being absolutely appalled by it. And I really, really was just so traumatized by the whole thing and, and still am really. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's the impression. The impression I get is that anyone with a soul, basically, who goes to Israel and I mean, even even in Tel Aviv, right? Like, yeah. if you have a soul and you notice these things, mm. which are just on the face of it, very fucking weird. Uh, I mean, and then as you get closer to these, like, sorry, go on. I mean, I can see for lots of reasons why Tel Aviv is the the city that they really sell to outsiders. The yeah. weather's mm. beautiful, the sea's beautiful, the people are beautiful and very violent. Um, as a friend of mine summed up, a friend of mine from Tel Aviv huh. summed up to me the other day. You know, you've got this gay scene, you've got an interesting kind of sports scene, you have a big kind of modernist monument to the Holocaust, and you have obviously yeah, all this, you know, really incredible architecture. It's a very modern city and it, it's you know, it feels like a a really kind of interesting and beautiful and sort of historically loaded place to be. Um but yeah, you you go anywhere near the West Bank and um it's it's just horror upon horror. And it really is just it's awful. it's yeah. It really it is one of the things you, right? that I've just, just, just felt very, that I find very hard to deal with is like just the, um, the propaganda, the Israeli propaganda of like, you know, an Israeli soldier standing on the beach in Gaza holding like, you know, an LGBT plus flag or, you know, two Israeli soldiers like kissing on the beach, like same gender. And it's just like, are we supposed to feel good about this? Yeah. And like yeah. sort of using that cover for like genocide is, is repulsive and just, you know, yeah. I mean, the, the photo was extraordinary. I mean, it really, you have to be so tone deaf. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I struggle to think of, of a kind of appropriate analogy for it from literature or film or, or you know, other politics. Yeah. But the image of that man, like, waving that rainbow flag and just saying the first LGBT flag ever raised in Gaza um, over just, you know, the fucking smoking ruins doubtless with people yeah. still buried underneath them like it, it beggars belief it, it really does and i just i you yeah. know i mean there are lots of ways in which you know i get why for kind of material reasons or sort of emotional or sentimental reasons or, or you know whatever people don't share share my politics but i really don't understand how you can look at something like that and just not be you know appalled and really if you have faith in the idea of israel not be shaken out of it because a lot of the kind of people who who support Israel will like lean on you know if they if they see someone who is openly queer like supporting the Palestinians they will like just immediately default to well why don't you go and like live in Gaza and have them throw you yeah, off a with building yeah a graphic fantasy of what yeah yeah, yeah. Always, would happen to you always. which is fucking they are which is fully consciously aware of the fact that they're just using like queer people for cover yeah mm. and it's also fucked up because there are queer people in Gaza like. Yeah. It's like they exist, and you know, people there have bigger fucking problems, frankly, um, than you know, worrying about that shit. Like, it's just it's, it's astonishing, especially since the bombing started. If you if you go online, you can see there's like a queering the globe, is it called, or queering the map, where if you're you can log onto the app and you can post a note and it'll geolocate it to your location, and so you can see what it's like being queer around the world, and the fucking. It's heartbreaking seeing the ones that have been posted in Gaza yeah, ever since it, it started. You know, it's sorry, like I'm not gonna worry about like hardline fundamentalist Muslims throwing, you know, queer people off buildings in Gaza when the buildings are being fucking blown down by yeah. the Israeli military. Like yeah. Jesus. Hey, just to come back on the, you know, like it, the the queer people being thrown off buildings is just another fucking line of propaganda. Like mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. To my mm. understanding, if you are caught being gay in Gaza, it is or was uh, punishable by like a prison sentence or something. And it's like, okay, obviously that's bad. Which is worse though, blowing gay people to smithereens because they just happen to be in one of the myriad buildings you're going to carpet bomb that day, or uh, it's so, just not even comparable. And I mean, just just to loop back to something we were saying earlier. Uh, I just googled penalty for being gay in Gaza and the first entry is from the Human Dignity Trust and it just comes up Palestine it just says 
Same-sex sexual activity is prohibited in Gaza under the British Mandate Criminal Code Ordinance 1930. Oh, yeah, Jesus, of course. Yeah. Jesus, there we go. Um, so, yeah. again, um, oh, the relevant that's provi- all us, baby. The relevant provision yeah. carries a maximum penalty of 10 years imprisonment. Uh, only men are criminalised under this law. So is the Criminal Law Amendment Act 1885 just, just transferred to Gaza, although not elsewhere in, in Palestine? There is little evidence of the law being enforced, and it appears to be largely obsolete in practice. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The, um, so, yeah. The, the, the trope about like fucking queer people being thrown off the roof in Arab countries, though, is literally just like, um, I think because ISIS did that. Or you know what I mean, and it's like, and you know, they're all the same over there, aren't they? Yeah. ISIS didn't like the funny thing is like ISIS didn't throw someone off a roof for being like that was that was again propaganda. The person who got thrown off a roof it went round, and I'm not saying they've never thrown them off a roof. I'm just saying the particular inciting incident is stuck in everyone's head. Mm. Um, no, they threw them off the roof because they'd been in, uh, basically committed an act of apostasy, and it wasn't related to being gay. Uh, but when it hit the Western world, it's like, oh look, this person was homosexual and they threw him off the roof, and it's just. Honestly, it is just pure projection on the part of the bigots who are using gay people as cover, frankly, you know? Yeah. Well, it's also very thinly veiled of, if I was in charge, this is my yeah. power fantasy. Yeah, well. You know, like, uh, that's, well, that's the other the thing. part. It's like, it, you know what I mean? It's it's what they want to do, and since they're not allowed, the least you can do, like, for, you know, for, they they don't do that to, to us because they're not allowed to, and the, 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 the most gracious way for us to appreciate that mercy would be to join their fucking side of any argument. Yeah, mm. I yeah, mm. I was I, so I was in in I, I've never been to Israel or to to the the occupied territories or, um, but like I I was in I was in Berlin uh, last week and I'd never been before, and so one of the places I I went to because I do think that it's very important is um I went to the Jewish Museum in in Berlin, and if you've never been, it's it's very of course about the. The Holocaust, and it's it's a, it's an extraordinary museum. It, as a museum, it's one of the best things I've, I've seen in years. It makes incredible use of artifacts and art and multimedia, and the building itself, the architecture is really, really quite something. And it's it's something that I think if you have the chance, and certainly if you have the you know financial means, it's something you owe to your to yourself to, to see in 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 your life um, at some point. There's a, it's it, it's really well done. You sort of start on top, and it's a lot of Jewish culture, and you know this is how sort of the the religion interacts with the culture, and some of the you know great thinkers that come from it, and you know this is a Torah, what is the Sabbath, all that stuff. So you get that sort of background, and as you move down through the layers of the museum, like you get through to Weimar Germany, which is you know obviously a great cultural flourishing for for Jewish people in. Germany and and then you get of course to 1932-33 and the advent of the Nazis and mm. and and you have this this extraordinary room and it's it's again it's really well done um you walk through it and on, it's both on your left and your right hand side if I recall it correctly they have these long they sort of banners and they're hanging down from the ceiling and on on them like through time so you start in 1932 and you end in 39 or 43 no 45 even um you have all these, they're, and they're, they're all the um, the legal rules that the Nazis then enforced. You know, first it starts with you know um, butchers are no longer uh, allowed to slaughter um, according to the rules of kosher, and you know it it starts quote unquote small and it gets progressively worse and worse. And the last thing you see in 1945, in like September 19, right before the 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 surrender, is basically like a an uh, an interdepartmental um, demand saying destroy um, all related documents of how we, um, you know, destroy yeah. Jewish economic life. It's it's really quite something. But you walk through there and you see all that, and then you you keep in mind what you see now. And I'm not I'm not doing that thing where I'm equating Jewish people in Germany to Israel to today. I know there are extraordinary differences, and I'm not making that you know. All Jews are Israel, and Israel is all Jews. Because that's that's I'm I'm really not doing that. But you walk through there, and 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 you get out of that museum, and it's incredibly impressive. And all I could think is like, with this history, you know, and with the 
I can't think of another word to call it, even though it's kind of debased and it's hard to put it into words correctly, but with like sort of the cover that that provides the state of Israel to do what they do. Because every every charge of, you know, genocide and every charge of of war crimes is just answered well. Israel must be able to defend itself. And, and like knowing that history of what parts of your own people have been through to just repeat it, not word for word, I know, and I'm, tr- you know, I'm picking my words very, I mean, very carefully here. But it, it Norm Finkelstein yeah. goes like sort of has written book books, I think, at this point uh, about the role that uh, the Holocaust plays in um, like Israeli politics and how they weaponize that history. And yeah, so you're 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 definitely not the first person to see these no like, i know i did i did i i, I don't pre- pre- you know for most no, of the no, podcast no, no, no. i don't what, pretend what I mean, to present the original what I mean material is it's not but... like you're conjuring this out of thin air yeah it it i just I, f- I found it very i found it personally very difficult to to deal with and then i find mm. to you know to turn back to sort of where we started in this in this segment um because i want to start moving towards wrapping it up as well um it, it, it that the fact that 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 in the UK media we we take all this and these very difficult things and you know the story you you told Juliet about being there in these places and appreciating a part of the complexity and the humanity and the inhumanity and then we reduce it down to whether or not a team on a on a you know a fairly parochial quiz can have an octopus is I I. Yeah. I find it I would say though that like appalling. it is not a complicated situation no. in Israel. No, it's not. It it's is, not. It, but like, yeah. And the, the, but the broader contract and uh, context and the longer history and the you know like oh you, yeah you, yeah naturally like I mean Britain for example being like a, like a crucial piece of the entire fucking debacle. Um, yeah, is something all too all too easily forgotten, particularly yeah. in this fucking country. Uh, but uh, as far as far as my understanding goes, the Palestinians are very fucking aware of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm. and there's certain things we only know about, like the sykes picot agreement, because of the uh, Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. So, can draw your own conclusions about whether we need more of those or not. But... Yeah, <laughs> maybe that would yeah. be a good way to teach people some history. I don't know. <laughs> it's. Mm. Uh, I think you know Bolshevik revolutions are always a great way to, to it's to, to teach both yourself about history and you know to learn more about your body and and what makes you yeah, feel good. It's a great way to stay in shape. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus All Christ! Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, official podcast position is genocide is bad, folks. Yeah. Don't yeah, do yeah. it. That puts it's us, real bad. That puts um, above the name and CLP. Party. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. A low bar, if ever there was one. Yeah, shall we? Shall we uh, end on a somewhat lighter note and do uh, a delightful game of comment or commentary? Yeah, yeah, sure. Lighter note. I can't wait to hear what Jamie found on GBNews.com. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. bird sniffing like jihad. It still hasn't left. Me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Even MPs do not realise there is no pot of government money. The account should <laughs> slash does. Belong to taxpayers of the UK. Oh, f- oh. Scotland already mismanages the pocket money it receives from taxpayers. <laughs> what right do they have to more from hardworking, struggling taxpayers? Um, comment or commentary? I'm, gonna, I'm going with uh, commentary, and I'm going to say Tim Stanley unheard. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, poisonous cocktail. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say... Oh, I'm going to say comment. Pocket money's like, it's two out there. Yeah, comment. I'm going to say comment on the... Comment BBC. I'm going to say commentary. Mm. I don't think that's two out there at all. No, I think that's exactly in the commentary at Wheelhouse. Like, yeah. <laughs> that was a comment at the Express. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I'm still not apologising to Tim Stanley. Um... <laughs> oh, absolutely fucking not. He's going to go and laugh at his bow tie, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. I tackled my own problems step by step. I reduced my calorie intake slowly, eating smaller portions, avoiding sugar, and not drinking alcohol on weeknights. I walk for at least 30 minutes a day and have taken up Pilates and yoga. I now weigh nine stone something instead of 11 stone. 
Willpower is one thing, but you can't beat the support of a healthcare professional to help make meaningful change in your life, and I'd urge any reader to seek advice. But we need politicians to grasp the nettle, too, with powerful new measures to protect us from those who have no interest in the nation's health, but only in cashing in on sick Britain. Is that comment or commentary? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, address, the address to readers means it's kind of readers, got to be commentary, yeah. I think. Uh, so I think yeah. the fun Ooh, here is know. more who is it. Um, mm. I, I'm, I'm going to guess Hadley Freeman in the Times. It, yeah, it's definitely the tele- it smells like the Telegraph or the Times because it has that like you know I I'm not angry I'm disappointed tone towards the plebs. Um, <laughs> I did. Th- I'm I'm feeling Telegraph. It feels it's it's got that kind of narcissistic edge to it where it's like let me tell you about my personal account and use that to justify doing something horrendous. So Telegraph. Mm, yeah, commentary. Uh, Sarah Vane. All right, that was from an article called uh, titled. I lost more than a stone, so what's stopping the work shy by Nadine Dorries in the Daily Mail? <laughs> oh, oh, look at me. That's horrible. Um, Jesus. Curse. Strange. I wonder what he'd say if the native Argentinian people said they wanted their original land back from the Spanish conquistadors. Would they be willing to start those negotiations, I wonder? Or would they accept the people voting to identify as Argentinians? Is that comment or commentary? Oh, it's got to be commentary. Comment. Um, I feel like the start of that sentence sound made me think comment, so I'm going to go with comment. Yeah, I'm going to go with the same comment. Comment. Let's say let's say the Times comment. Yeah, where time. where do I think that commentary is from? Um, who would write about Jeremy Corbyn in 2023? Um, <laughs> every of, single I mean, last one of yeah, them. Every single true. one. Oh, oh, right, opening not, the not, Wikipedia gonna, page for British media. Yeah, I'm not going to try <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Try and narrow it down there. I'm going commentary out there. All right. Uh, that was a comment in the Express. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it was yeah. one. It was it was under an article about fucking um, General Ancap. Of course it was. Saying <laughs> that he wants, he wants the Falklands back. But, like, the, there was a surprising amount of Express uh, commenters who were, like, deeply interested in the land rights of indigenous peoples suddenly. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How have we allowed this to happen? How did it happen that the whole of the Western media and the political and arts establishment are united in their quest to avoid criticism of one particular religion? Have they done that out of respect or fear? Like I said, Britain is a secular society. All religions should be respected, but no one religion should be allowed respect or tolerance above the rest. But that's exactly what it feels like is happening. Is that comment or commentary? I think that's Brendan. It it, oh. it could be Bar- Brendan or it's the mm. dead hand of Giles Corrin. Ooh, oh, that's a good no, shout. I think I'm, try- I'm trying to remember the fucking freak's name. Um, Seb Payne. <laughs> no, no, that's this is a bit too low brow for him. I yeah, feel like somehow. not nerdy enough. Yeah. No. Oh, you mean like you mean like Rod Little or or what? Are yes, the, the, yes, the other Rod one? Little. Richard, that's Little who John. I was trying to think of. Mm. It could be a Rod Little. I think it's commentary. I'll go with Alistair and yeah, Rod Little. Yeah, commentary at Rod Little is where my money is. I'm going to say comment. Mm. That was uh, that was Carol Malone in the Express. <laughs> You've really been at the Express this week. Um, the Express is a gold mine mm, for this. Of course it is. Yeah. yeah. Plus, he needed them quick. <laughs> also, I don't have to fucking fanny about getting behind a paywall to see yeah. their stuff. <laughs> I mean, I, through um, the university I work for, I have access to ProQuest, so I can get around paywalls. So, you know, what better oh, use nice. for it than to, you know, read fucking <laughs> Victoria Freeman. <laughs> shit, yeah. Right. Um, a new guide to phone use published by Debretz suggests that old people oh. will call out of the blue while young people are frightened by unexpected calls presumably because the person calling is likely to be old, so might say something triggering like gollywog or peanut. <laughs> is that comment or commentary? <laughs> <laughs> little John. I'm going Little John. Little John. Yeah, that feels Little John. I'm going to say Daily Mail comment. Mm. Yeah, that this feels oh. a lot. This feels very Little John. This, yeah. Although Debrett is a bit too high-reaching for him. I'm going to go back true. to Giles Corrin. Yeah, it was Giles Corrin in the Times. Hey. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> well done, Rob. Yeah. Right. Um. One. One more. Uh. 
could Russia be sponsoring such illegal movements of migrants across Europe? It would fall very much into the murky grey zone of hybrid and operation short of war zone that the Kremlin and its acolytes are fond of frequenting. It is oh, also God. eminently deniable and untraceable, which would suit their purposes just fine too. Anything that weakens the West is good news for Putin and Moscow. We need to up our game here and be on our guard. Is that comment or commentary? Commentary at Simon Shitbag Montefiore. <laughs> <laughs> I think comment for this one, actually. I think comment as yeah. well, actually. Yeah, I think it's, it's, yeah. I think it's, yeah, I'm, I think I'm it's comment, comment by, uh, by at S. Sharma. <laughs> Uh, that was Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Crawford writing for the Express. <laughs> Jesus Christ. The, Bri- no, sorry, the British General Anchor. are always coming. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I, 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 I pulled a bonus one, um, oh, which you. is, it's quite clearly commentary, but the, the, the game here is you have to guess the... T- <laughs> Uh, sorry, it's it's um it's quite clearly a comment, but you have to guess which story it was a comment under. Ooh. Okay. Ooh. Okay. okay. Right. Twist. Dave Cameron highlighted that the bill signifies the UK's entry into the heart of a group of some of the world's most dynamic economies, unlike the sluggish EU economies. The speech crafted prior to Cameron's shock appointment was initially slated for delivery by former Foreign Secretary and Brexiteer James Cleverly. Guido hears that Cleverly's original script included a segment highlighting the benefits of Brexit, Jesus. with this new bill being a prime example of making the most of its advantages. It wouldn't have been a surprise if Cleverly were to do a bit on Brexit benefits. In fact, it should be expected. However, when Lord Cameron delivered his speech, he notably excluded any advantages of leaving the bloc, or that this historic bill illustrates a capitalisation of the pros of leaving the EU. He's clearly in denial that Brexit has delivered any benefits. He didn't even mention the word Brexit at all. Remainer Dave just couldn't bring himself to say it. But what was that a comment under? Um, is it on Jesus. about leaving the European Court of Human Rights? Is that where it's looking at? No. No, it's um, got to be something much more insane. Is it Rwanda related? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I like the way you think. <laughs> is, it, is it something to do with other, it, the English cricket team or some bullshit? No. Is it Rwanda related? No. Alistair, do you want to have a pop? I, I, my brain has been turned to mush. <laughs> okay, well, the headline, Lorraine sparks uproar with below-the-belt insult named, aimed at Nigel Farage's appearance. Oh, my God, <laughs> boy. God, it's not strictly. Oh, not strictly. Um, fuck, I'm yeah, a, I'm a, I'm a celebrity. Yeah, yeah. Give me a, yeah. yeah. Apparently, oh, she, she was surprised hell. when someone said he was only 59 or something yeah, like that. Right. She went, oh, God, he looks much older. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you she would if correct. you lived on that diet. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's coming from me. Well, I eat fucking shit. Like. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Ambassador, you do spoil us with these treats. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ, Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. All right, bef- well. Before we we uh, we start off, uh, first of course, uh, Juliet. If people want more Juliet in their lives, and they should have more Juliet in their lives, what well, what should what should uh, you know what should they do? JulietJakes dot com, um, intermittently on Twitter when I have to plug something. Try not to be on there if I can help it. Uh, so don't follow me there. Um, but yeah, go to <laughs> go to JulietJakes dot com and uh, yeah, Philly boots. We should get you on Blue Sky, Juliet. Uh, I'm not doing any more Much social media. Advice. I've, uh, ah. I'm, I'm swearing off it. Um, That's yeah, <laughs> wise, you wise. Missed, you missed the blue sky golden age, anyway. You know, there That's was a true. Couple, couple of months where it was, couple of months where it was peaceful, and now it's just full of Germans screaming about like uh, Palestinians. My my friend yeah. Tom mm. just like wrote to me and said like. It's like a party and the FBP lads have just shown up. I'm like, Tom, that's the worst advert I've ever heard for anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you to yell at them and then and then that's very cathartic in my opinion. <laughs> uh it wasn't five years ago. Um, it's just annoying. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but before we get to 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 our own plugs, uh, I'm gonna do a brief plug of my very very own for for a change. Um, I went on a very little known obscure podcast called uh, Well, There's Your Problem, um, and um, I talked about mount, mountaineering and mountaineering disasters on Everest for like three hours or something. It's well, uh, the ongoing so, mountaineering disaster that is Everest. That is Everest. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> a better better way of putting it. So uh, go listen to that. It's uh, it's pretty cool. And uh, it was very kind of to have me on. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, I listened mm. to it as Much well. Much like uh, the mountain, the episode count hungles. So yeah, go listen. Yeah. <laughs> or watch even since it's where there's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, for us, um, patreon.com follows us, practice cash. You know the drill. Just just fucking, just join it. Just yeah. just give us some money. Please give, give us a little bit of money. We'll be nice to you on you the can, Discord, I you promise. Can, we might be nice to you on the Discord. Um, yeah, we you, make no you can promises. Really do, there are some people you're allowed to bully. Um, I wouldn't say who. You need to find out yourself. But there are some people you're allowed to bully, Rob. Um, and also, you can follow us on Blue Sky. Uh, don't follow us on Twitter. Leave the website. It's dog shit. And um, merch is available at praxiscast.tmail.com. And yeah, we will see you all next time. Thank you again, Juliet, for coming on. Um I'm very sorry, but it won't be the last time. Uh, that is a threat and a <laughs> no, promise. No, no, always, always happy to come back. So, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, one day I will find a copy of that West Streeting book, I promise you. Oh, God, yeah. I Jesus. need to share that pain, yeah. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> Even Sinan's not <laughs> touch it. <Yeah>. No. <laughs> <laughs> they, they demanded that we do something nice instead of I more books. So, you know. Yeah. 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 Uh, anyway, I think that'll do us for, right. for yet another recording. Bye. Yeah. Yes. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.